Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers and ranchers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. U.S. Farm Report features a look at agriculture with Walter Miller, president of Ontario Farmers Union, Ontario, Canada. O.L. Evans, Avocado Growers Bargaining Council of Fulbrook, California. And Monsignor Weber of the National Catholic Rural Life. Here now is Ed Shima, Farm Reporter. Uh, this is Ed Shima reporting for U.S. Farm Report. Uh, today's uh, program is entitled A Look at Agriculture. We have three uh, men on the program today from uh, quite a cross-section of, uh, of American agriculture and certainly uh, quite a cross-section as far as uh, geography is concerned in the map. Uh, starting off, we'll introduce real briefly the three men. We have uh, uh, next to me is Monsignor Weber, who is with the Catholic Rural Life Conference. He is the uh, executive secretary, uh, is with, and the uh, Catholic Rural Life Conference is headquartered at Des Moines, Iowa. Sitting next to him is uh, Mr. Evans, uh, who is with the uh, uh, Avocado Growers Bargaining Council at Fallbrook, California. And uh, certainly, uh, California is uh, quite a ways off for most of you viewers that are watching U.S. Farm Report today. Then going on, we have uh, Walter Miller, who is uh, president of the Ontario Farmers Union, who is clear on the other side of the continent almost for Mr. Evans. And uh, I think at this point, we will uh, discuss with each of them just real briefly their uh, general areas and situations and so on. And we'll start off with Monsignor Weber and uh, how you got involved in the Catholic Rural Life Conference and what the Catholic Rural Life Conference is and so on. Well, to answer your first question uh, first, Ed, uh, I got involved by a simple request from my bishop out in the Salina Diocese in Western Kansas by asking me to be Rural Life Director for, for the Salina Diocese. That was back in 1958. And then in 1960, I was requested to uh, be Executive Secretary of the National Catholic Rural Life Conference in Des Moines. And so I've been working in that office ever since 1960. Now, the National Catholic Rural Life Conference uh, has as its general objective to uh, try to improve the spiritual conditions, the spiritual life and values of the people in the rural areas and rural communities and then also the social conditions and the economic conditions. You know, you can't separate the economic conditions from your social conditions or your spiritual conditions. Mm -hmm. They all tie together in making a living man. Mm -hmm. And when you try to separate the soul from the body, well, you know, you're dead. And uh, we certainly don't want that. That's right. And uh, going on to uh, Mr. Evans. Uh, first of all, I think, Mr. Evans, we have uh, uh, Two things we'd like to have you do here, first of all, is to uh, explain just exactly what avocados are. Uh, quite a few people I, uh, in this general area of, of the United States aren't too acquainted with them, actually. Well, this is an avocado, mm -hmm. and an avocado is a fruit. You might term it a salad fruit. Mm -hmm. It grows on a tree compared to an apple tree or a pear tree. You uh, harvest it. One problem we have with it it is a so-called green fruit, and it must be harvested and ripened in the kitchen. And it is ripe when you can touch it, and it gently gives to the pressure. Mm -hmm. Then you cut it in half and peel it, take out the large stone in the center, and use it either on the half shell, as they term it, with salad dressing in the middle, or you can slice it and use it in the salad. It is uh, delicious with grapefruit. Many people use it that way. Mm -hmm. So this is an avocado. And uh, uh, what time of the year do you harvest those in? This is an all-year crop. We have several varieties. There's two primary varieties. This is a Fuerti, which we term the winter variety. This would come into production about the 1st of October, stay on the tree until roughly the end of April. Then we have the summer variety called the Hass that is uh, somewhat different in color than this. Many people call it a black avocado, but it's, uh, in principle, it's the same. Mm -hmm. 
Now, uh, how did you uh, get involved in the avocado growing uh, uh, in California? Well, I got um, tired of having um, two close neighbors. So I wanted to go out where I could have a little room around myself and hear the coyote yowl. <laughs> so I moved to Fallbrook, California. And I understand you were in business in uh, Los Angeles before you went into the avocado. I was in business in Los Angeles yes. before we went into the avocado. And uh, then uh, the uh, California avocado growers uh, set up an association to do, uh, uh, to do a better job of marketing the avocados. And, yes, uh, uh, we were most fortunate in having a fellow by the name of Homer Smothers, whom many of you may know. He was with the University at Ames, Iowa, and he was acquainted with the NFO until Mr. Smothers came to Fallbrook about two years ago. None of us in Fallbrook had heard about the NFO. So through Mr. Smothers' understanding of how the NFO operates, he was able to get some growers together and organize the Avocado Growers Bargaining Council. Mm -hmm. And we'll go on to uh, Walter Miller from Canada. The, I guess, I don't know if you're farther uh, uh, away from the uh, Middle West than Mr. Evans is or not, but I suppose you're both about the same distance probably, in opposite direction. Uh, why don't you explain just real briefly, uh, Walter, your uh, uh, farming operation in Canada and what you do do in your area and, of Ontario and so on. Yeah, so we have a wide variety of farming carried on in Canada. Uh, we grow everything from uh, cereal grains, livestock, vegetables, tobacco, etc. Depend because of the uh, tremendous variety of climate that we have. Mind you, Canada also extends all the way from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from the 49th parallel to the Arctic. And uh, so we've got pretty near all the varieties that there are going. My own particular operation is a beef cattle operation, a stocker cattle operation. It's not maybe as large as some that we'll find down here. I know it isn't, but then of course it's been geared and organized in such a way over the years which would enable me to devote a great deal of my time to organization. I've been in uh, the, farmer, the farm movement now for close to 20 years, ever since it started. And uh, any farm organization man that is traveling the continent and devoting his energies and time to this kind of work, I don't care where he's from, he can't manage his farm operation with the same skill that he could if he was at home. I imagine uh, quite a few of the uh, viewers uh, that have helped the National Farmers Organization in organizing in the uh, United States here are quite aware of what you're saying and the uh, problems that are involved and the fact that you do uh, have to make a lot of sacrifices in order to help out your fellow man in terms of uh, improving yeah. the farm situation. Yeah, I think there's one point that I would like to make, and that is that we in the Farmers Union in Canada are very comparable to the National Farmers Organization in the States. That is to say, we are not in business, we do not own facilities, we are bargaining on behalf of our members. And uh, in this regard, there can be some confusion developed uh, as we go from one side of the border to the other. And I think this is a point that I'd like to make, Ed, uh, because uh, we're in the process now in Canada. As a matter of fact, in our convention recently, we were given a green light to go ahead and integrate our organization into a national structure comparable to the National Farmers Organization. Because we recognize that with the changing nature of business today uh, on the whole North American continent, that no group can effectively bargain in, in isolation, that they have got to reach out and be able to meet the people at the marketplace operating on the same basis as the industrial sector with whom we must deal. I understand that as far as uh, uh, your area is concerned, you've had problems with feed grains and so on and trying to do very much about it because of this, uh, uh, well, international situation. Oh, yes. Uh, we, we have... Uh, a 49th parallel up here, you know, that divides Canada and the United States, and it's been a very handy tool for to keep the farmers divided and uh, thus pitting them one against the other. But uh, the corporations didn't let it stop them. They, they formed their subsidiaries on both sides of the border, are able to move goods back and forth across the border, and, and thus uh, manipulate supply and demand to their advantage. And uh, we have a situation now, for example, we've just had a we're engaged in a continual battle, I should say, on corn. And uh, American corn is shipped up to the uh, north of the 49th parallel, fed to steers, and the meat is shipped back down here, which I'm told uh, forces your beef prices down. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, we have a similar situation, I understand, where potatoes are grown in the Maritimes and sent down into Maine and have a depressing effect on the price. And this is simply a question that uh, the farmers, I think, on a whole continent have got to realize that they are uh, not different, fundamentally different, that they're basically the same, they're being exploited by the same people, and uh, for this reason, I think we have to think in terms of bargaining on a much broader scale than we have ever dared to imagine before. Could I throw in a yes. comment here on this point? Uh, Monsignor Lagudi, as you know, was in the National Catholic Rural Life Conference for many years, and he's over in Rome now, representing the FAO for the Vatican. And he made this statement here several years ago, and he said the problems of the world, and he does a lot of traveling around the world, he said the problems of the world are the problems of the land and the people on the land. And he said the problems of the people on the land is production and price for their production. He said that holds true around the whole world, their production and price for their production. Well, I would have to agree with this. I haven't traveled around the whole world, although I've traveled uh, quite a bit of it, and I can honestly say there are not many problems in Canadian agriculture today that better prices wouldn't cure. We well, find this uh, true in uh, agriculture here also. Uh, could I ask, are we being, someone used the term exploited, are we being exploited because we do not have any contract for our product? We have no price for it. Well, this, uh, this I'm sure, has been a, quite a problem and in in our major problem. Well, we and approved that in one easy lesson, one summer, by getting a contract for our avocados. Why don't you go into some details on this and uh, how, how you went about it and your successes and problems and so on. I'm sure, Mr. Evans, that the uh, uh, listeners uh, uh, in the audience uh, that are watching U.S. Farm Report would be interested in what the avocado growers uh, have done in California and how they've done it and uh, so Well, on. we organized the Avocado Growers Bargaining Council and through the membership, we were able to go to a handler or a processor and get a contract with him that he would guarantee us a floor price of 25 cents per pound. By doing that... Uh, what was the regular, what was the price, uh, what's your normal price? Uh, uh, that's a very good word, normal, because there is no normal price for an avocado. Uh -huh. It's whatever the handler wants to give the grower when he takes the avocado down to the handler. Mm -hmm. So by establishing the floor price at 25 cents per pound with the one handler, naturally the other handlers had to come in in order to get a product to sell to their handlers. And it was rather interesting because when we got this contract, this floor price at 25 cents per pound, we seem to have the handlers competing with each other to get the avocado. So that meant that one handler would say, I will give you 26 cents. Another said, I will give you 27 cents. And by having this floor price of 25 cents per pound, we were able to finally end up the season with avocado selling for 40 cents per pound. Mm -hmm. I think that's quite an accomplishment. Yes, but when you, when you were selling these at 8 cents, were they selling correspondingly that much less in the, in the stores to the public? The answer is no. They were still selling four for a dollar. Four for a dollar. Yeah. Regardless of what you get, they sell about the That's same right. stores. And right? if avocado is selling for 25 cents per pound for the grower, that means that actually an avocado that is selling for 25 cents is bringing 50 cents per pound. Because an avocado, an avocado this size, will weigh approximately eight ounces. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So if we get 25 cents for two of these, and one of these sells for 25 cents, that means that they... In other words, just for marketing, they're, uh, they're making as much off of it as you are for all of the production that's involved. That's correct. Mm -hmm. They're making 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this we did it all with contract. Mm -hmm. uh, going uh, on then uh, to uh, the avocado growers, uh, what sort of uh, system did you use in, uh, in setting up this 25 cent floor price? How did you go about establishing this? We had a meeting of the members of the Avocado Council mm -hmm. and agreed on what price we wanted per pound for the avocado. Mm -hmm. And the price agreed upon was 25 cents, so we turned that our floor price. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at that point, the avocado uh, buyer didn't want to pay that. Is that right? Uh, they more or less hedged and hemmed around, but they're not going out of business. Uh -huh. They have to have something to sell. Are so your sales uh, maintaining the, their regular volume? After your price, after you raised your price, do you sell as many as you did before? I would say that we sold more. 
because the uh, chain store who was buying the avocado knew what he had to pay per pound to get that avocado. Therefore, he in turn could price the product. In other words, and he had a more stable uh, price and, uh, and was able to run it on a more stable that's basis. That's right. He could take on more avocados and sell more for us mm -hmm. because he knew what price he had to pay for them and what price he could get for them in the market. Uh, going on back to uh, uh, Walter, uh, what have uh, you done at this point as far as the Canadian Farmers Union is concerned to uh, try to tie together uh, farmers in terms of doing something for the Canadian farmers in terms of getting a better price? Well, we, we have been, as I said, operating under what we consider to be somewhat of an obsolete system in that we are organized provincially by provincial organizations, and we have been endeavoring to fight through this and, uh, and in spite of this weakness, still do something. Now, uh, over the last two or three years, we have been very successful uh, concentrating on one commodity at a time. And a couple of years ago, uh, or two and a, three years ago, I should say, we concentrated on milk. And our industrial milk, for example, was selling at that time at around two dollars and sixty-five cents a hundred. You may have read in the papers, you know, where a bunch of our farmers become very unconventional and uh, after desperate attempts to, to move the government uh, in the country and, and uh, with n no uh, results at all, uh, decided to take their tractors out on the highway and, and rouse public opinion. The general public wouldn't listen to a normal broadcast, you know. They said, sure, we sympathize with you. Too bad, fellas. Uh, good luck. And, and that was the end of it. But what did uh, you have, a parade? Well, they, the uh, farmers took their tractors out and maintained a rolling picket line for several weeks. And uh, as the general public were heading for their cottages and were heading for their summer resorts and got slowed down for a few hours, all of a sudden it struck them that maybe this was their problem and that they had some concern. And with thousands of farmers doing this, you can imagine what happened. Well, uh, the government then was put under tremendous pressure by public opinion. With the result, they reversed the decision they had made earlier, and uh, we established a pipeline of communication with government that we hadn't had prior to this. And uh, in those two years, or a little over two years, we have raised the price of industrial milk to the farmer from $2.65 a hundredweight to $4.75 a hundredweight. Mm -hmm. And we're anticipating another raise this year, and if we don't get her, there could be trouble, because our costs are there, and uh, our farmers have been uh, studying somewhat of what their costs are, and when they see everybody else getting a big increase, for example, like our banks got in Canada this year, uh, a 50% increase net, and uh, farmers sitting there taking a little less or nothing at all, they, they reach a point then where they decide that uh, if ours is to be a country where people are equal, then some shouldn't be more equal than others. Could I get back to this contract? <coughs> this price was for our crop last year. Mm -hmm. Now this year, as I pointed out, the winter variety comes on about the 1st of October. We do not have any contracts with the handlers. As a result, we have seen the price of avocados go from at the beginning of the season, when they're rather few to market, from 47 cents a pound down to 10 cents a pound. And uh, what? I might ask, why weren't you able to, uh, to maintain this uh, contract or this better price? It's a uh, contract that should be renewed and must be renewed every year. Mm -hmm. And they refuse to renew it this year? The uh, council is in the process of negotiating with them at the present time. I think an interesting thing along this line is that uh, several years ago, uh, and Senior Weber, you may remember Dr. Slaybecker at uh, oh, Ames. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, he had some uh, counsel for the NFO and for farmers in terms of, uh, of uh, bargaining and getting better prices and so on. And uh, he was uh, primarily a historian, and he looked into the past history of other organizations and what they'd done and their, and their successes and failures and why and so on. And one thing that he uh, was quite evident to him that uh, he had told us at that time was that uh, it was not the first success that was the problem. It was the second one, getting that, uh, in other words, the second contract or the second year. Uh, you might sort of slip up on this uh, person you're dealing with, the process or whoever it might be the first time, but the second time, he was going to be really organized and out to fight you with all he had, and the second uh, go around was going to be your real problem. And uh, I suppose maybe this might uh, be evident in your situation there also. I in think other words, you're going to have to regroup your forces to uh, combat the... Uh, extra effort the opposition is making to you there. Well, we are regrouping the forces in this way, that with 
in the last year we have increased our membership by over 100 percent. And I think that is all that can, can be contributed to the fact that we had a contract last year. It, uh, well, in other words, what this points out is what farmers can do uh, if they put their heart to it. And if they have an interest in what they're growing. Yes. Well, I think what you point out here, Ed, is that the need for farm leaders to maintain flexibility so they can change their strategy. Because yes. once you have, uh, let's face it, we're at economic war. And uh, if we're going to be nice guys, we're going to come out second best. Nice guys just don't win ball games in this mm -hmm. continent. And uh, uh, when we talk about collective bargaining and we talk about farmers putting a price on their product, we should recognize that that is a responsibility or a, an opportunity or a privilege enjoyed by the industrial sector today. And what we're really talking about is transferring from the industrial sector to the farmer the power to set his price. And if any one of us was sitting in the corporation president's chair and somebody tried to take that power away from us, we'd fight back. And if they succeeded in the first round, we'd try to plan our strategy so as to stop them the second time. And I think farm organizations have got to be flexible enough to be prepared for this, to to project themselves into that president's chair and try to anticipate the next move. And, and uh, we've got the power. There's no question that the production of the North American continent is so fantastic, there isn't a corporation in business today that can hold a candle for us. That's right. It's just a question of putting it together. And I sometimes tell the Canadian farmers, we looked all over the world for the solution to the farm problem, and we found it right at the road gate. All we've got to do is close it and say, that's it, boys. The product is here, and you can have her as soon as you're ready to pay the price. Isn't yeah, it yeah. amazing what we can see when we open our eyes? Mm -hmm. But there's one other point I'd like to go back to, if I may, Ed, and, yeah. and you, you ask the question. I don't want to leave the interpret or the uh, suggestion with the public that all we talk about is milk, because uh, this is one area that we've worked on, but there's another area that we're working on now, which I think the American uh, public will find interesting, and that is our corn. We've, we've uh, just as uh, within the past year, we've embarked on a program of real collective bargaining for our corn, and uh, we find that the reason that our price is driven down is not because of supply and demand, because uh, we have a shortage of corn. We have to import corn, but uh, the price is still going down, and it's going down because of the availability of your reserve supplies here are being used to manipulate the prices. Mm -hmm. So we have in, in uh, the last year, our farmers have been signing contracts, legal contracts, literally signing that corn over to us to, to bargain on their behalf. And uh, we find, of course, that there is a problem here as long as this is available. And uh, I hope that we can be successful in persuading the, and I don't anticipate any problem, the, the uh, American farmers collectively to bargain to think in terms of bargaining on an international basis. That I think if we can tie this corn up both sides of the border, and uh, the people that will, that have to have it, then have to bargain with us. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the uh, National Farmers Organization found out years ago that in order to bargain successfully, you had to be over a large area. And at that time, they were thinking in terms of, well, you'd need all of the states in the United States, uh, or the country, in other words, pretty well organized to be successful. And uh, I suppose what we're finding out now is that you need to uh, go continental, in other words, and. Uh, and uh, have the whole continent working together on this. I think, um, and Senior Weber, that, uh, that uh, uh, Walter raised a question here that uh, is of quite a lot of concern to a lot of people. I know you hear uh, farmers talk about this. Yes, it's fine for uh, business people, corporations, and so on to set a price on their product and hold it for that price, as every businessman in town does. You hold for that price. But it's morally wrong and it's wrong for farmers to do this they shouldn't do this it's morally wrong for them to do it as a uh, person that's uh, involved in uh, church affairs and uh, closely associated with what uh, uh, a person a christian person should be doing and thinking and so on what's your answer to this uh, problem or question well, <clears throat> my answer would be that it goes back to the principle of justice and so we uh, look at the farmer and uh, he has the expenses of producing his investment, his labor, and so on. And he is entitled to a re fair return on what he has there invested and the labor he puts in. And so the principle of justice, so the farmer is entitled to a fair return on all that. And if he isn't getting justice, in other words, a fair return, a fair price, well, then he not only has a right to get that justice, but he has a duty to go out and seek it. And that's where his organization with, the other, with his fellow farmers is very important and vital 
uh, that he goes out and seeks a just price and fair return on what he produces. And in, and in doing this, then, there's nothing uh, morally wrong with no. the farmer operating just as any businessman does. He has a duty to operate on a basis where he can support himself and his family. Uh, as far as the uh, Catholic Real Life Conference is concerned, uh, uh, I know that you've studied the farm situation for a long time and are quite acquainted with it and so on. And as far as the farmers that are in the audience today uh, watching uh, U.S. Farm Report, what would be some of your uh, suggestions and recommendations that uh, they should uh, do in terms of uh, improving their economic and social lot and so on? Well, I think the first thing they have to do is to uh, change some attitudes. And one of the basic changes that is required is that we have to work together. God made us that way. You know, uh, we didn't just come from nowhere. We came from somebody else, dependent on somebody else. And uh, uh, so the same way throughout our whole life, we're always dependent on somebody else. And even if you drop dead right here and now, well, you're, uh, you'd be a stinking mess after a while if nobody else came along, picked you up, and gave you a nice funeral. <laughs> and uh, so we are, we are dependent on somebody else. And so in our social attitudes, we have to change those and uh, apply them and working with each other and solving our problems. And that's the only way that we can solve them. I think that would be the greatest achievement that they can do right now is to, to get these attitudes changed of working together and cooperating on a really open-minded basis. Uh, the, uh, this is true. I think uh, also going, uh, uh, now we're, you're with the Catholic Real Life Conference, of course, and as we know, uh, you've been, uh, not only you as a priest, but uh, the Catholic Real Life Conference has been vitally interested in American, uh, in right. rural America. Right. And I think we find that uh, quite a few of the other church groups are quite concerned too. I know the, uh, yes, the uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mueller with the Lutheran Church Lutheran has been churches, real concerned. And, uh, and Dr. Some, Henry McKenna of the National, National Council of Churches and uh, uh, Lois Newman with the Southern Baptist mm -hmm. Church and uh, Dr. Huff with the uh, Methodist Church. There, there's a number of them. And we, we work together on many uh, different phases and uh, certainly appreciate this work. And I, I think uh, in uh, trying to bring this about to get people to understand that their moral obligations imply that they have to work with the other people living around them and work together to make a better world. Mm -hmm. Then uh, as far as the other uh, uh, church groups are concerned, they basically, I guess you might say, they're all actively working toward improving the... Uh, uh, social and economic uh, right. situation on the farm, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly in doing this, it's going to improve the social and economic situation in all the country. Uh, sure. Mr. Evans, you mentioned uh, earlier in the program that you moved uh, away from L.A., uh, uh, I believe, uh, because of the uh, uh, climate. You mean uh, because of that word? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you mean smog. Smog, is that it? Well, yes, you know, it that is a problem, and that is um, sort of uh, another problem we're going to have to face. The and problem of air pollution. And uh, in, uh, in doing this, of course, uh, or as far as the uh, city problem is concerned, if, you, if we improve the farm problem, it's certainly going to help the city problem as far as uh, the uh, ghettos and so on that we have. That's very true because I moved out because I wanted some space around me, so that left more or less a deserted city. Fortunately, I could move out. There are those that can't move out. And I think because of that, we are getting our urban problem, our city problem. Uh, our time is drawing to a close today. And on today's program, we've had Monsignor Weber, with the, uh, who is Executive Secretary of the uh, National Catholic Rural Life Conference. Uh, we appreciate you being with us today, Monsignor Thank Weber. You. And uh, Mr. Evans with the uh, Avocado Growers Bargaining Council of Falls Brook, California, which is in Southern California, incidentally. And uh, also... Walter Miller, who is president of the Ontario Farmers Union. Uh, we appreciate you three people, uh, actually from across the country and uh, in almost different walks of life, but yet, we, but yet we appreciate you people being on today's U.S. Farm Report to help uh, us in this area to understand better some of the problems of uh, the North American continent. Thank you. U.S. Farm Report has presented A Look at Agriculture with special guests Walter Miller, President of Ontario Farmers Union, and O.L. Evans of the Avocado Growers Bargaining Council of Fullbrook, California, and Monsignor Weber of the National Catholic Rural Life Conference. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at this same time. 
for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking for a new generation of agricultural producers. A brighter day for American agriculture.